Krishna pleases his devotees. Text 13 and 14. So please repeat after me. Natan Naravara Shreshtan Arad Viksha Sobandavan Pratyutthaya Pramodita Parishvaya Parishvaya Bindyacha Nan, nanama Krishna Ram, Ramam Cha. Okay, sorry, this is text 14. So, <clears throat> both are combined, so I'll just read it. Anyway. Uh, I'll read the th- text 13 first. Satan Nara Vara Sheshtan Arad Viksha Swabandavan Pratyutthaya Pramodita Parishvaja Bhinandyacha Satan Naravara Sheshtan Arad Viksha Swabandavan Pratyutthaya Pramodita Parishvaja Bhinandyacha Satanaravara Sheshtan Satanaravara Sheshtan Arad Viksha Sabandava Satyukhaya Pramodita Satanaravara Sheshtan Parishvaja Vinandacha Mataji Satanaravara Sheshtan Text 13 and 14 are combined, so before we read the transliteration and translation, we read the t- text 14 also. Nanama Krishna Ramam Cha Satair Apya Vivadita Ujayam Asvidivat Kritasana Parigrahan. So, he, Akrura, Tan, them, Krishna, Balram, and Uddhav. Naravara of illustrious personalities. Sheshtan, the greatest. Arat, from a distance. Viksha, seeing. Sva, his, Akruras. Bandavan, relatives. Pratyuthaya, rising up. Pramudita, joyful. Parishvajya, embracing. Abhinandya, greeting. Cha, and Nanama, bowed bow down. Krishnam Ramam, Krishnam Ramam Cha. To Lord Krishna and Lord Balram, so he, te, by them, api, and abhivadita, greeted, pujayam, 
पूजयम आस पूजयम आस पूजयम आस ही वर्शिप्ड विधिवत अकॉर्डिंग टू स्क्रिप्चुरल इंजंक्शंस कृत हु हैड डन आसन ऑफ सीट्स परिग्रहण एक्सेप्टेंस ट्रांसलेशन एंड पोपोट बाय हम्बल डिसाइपल्स ऑफ हिज डिवाइन ग्रेस एसी बक्ते वेदांत और स्वामी शिला प्रभुपाद ट्रांसलेशन अक्रूरा स्टूड अप इन ग्रेट जॉय व्हेन ही सॉ देम हिज ओन रिलेटिव्स एंड द ग्रेटेस्ट ऑफ एक्सोल्टेड पर्सनालिटीज कमिंग फ्रॉम अ डिस्टेंस After embracing them and greeting them, Akrura bowed down to Krishna and Balram, and was greeted by them in return. Then, when his guests had taken their seats, he worshipped them in accordance with scriptural rules. Purport: Shri Lajiva Goswami points out that Lord Shri Krishna and the others approached Akrura in a friendly attitude. At first, Akrura reciprocated that friendly mood. and then in the course of showing them hospitality he adopted his natural devotional attitude toward the lord and thus offered his obeisances to shri krishna and shri balram om agyan timirandasya jnananjana shalakhaya chakshurun militam yena tasmay shri gurave namaha shri chaitanya mano bhishtam स्थापित ये न भूतले स्वयं रूप कदा दधाति स्वदाक वंदेहम श्री गुरु श्रीयुत पदकमल श्री गुरु वैष्णव श्रीरूप सागर जाता सहगना रघुनाथान्वितम तम सजीव साधवैत सवदूत परीजना सहित कृष्ण चैतन्य देव श्रीराधा कृष्णपद सहगना ललिता श्री विशाखान्वता हे कृष्ण करुणा सिंधु दीनबंधु जगत्पते गोपेश गोपिका कांत राधा कांत नमोस्तुते तप्त कांचन गौरांगी राधे वृंदावनेश्वरी वृषभानु सुते देवी प्रणमा हरि प्रिय वाचकलपतरूभ्य कृपा सिंधुव पतिता पावनेभ्यो वैष्णवेभ्यो नमो नमः जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु निनंद श्री अद्वैत गदाधर शिवा सदि गौर भक्त वृंद हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे सो टुडे इन दिस वर्स वी आर गेटिंग द ग्लिम्स ऑफ a uh, wonderful uh, perfect relationship role between the lord and his devotees uh how krishna and balram are really interacting with uh, akrura and how akrura reciprocates in uh, in the perfect mood and there are many lessons that we can also learn from that as shri jiva goswami mentions in the purport that uh he first akrura first uh, reciprocated the hospitality and the love which uh, on a friendship level with the lord and then after duly making them uh, appropriately seated he uh, did not forget his real role and then he worshiped them so uh, if we our uh, the, the difficulty we have in understanding um, real friendship or real uh, worship what to speak of the lord but even with uh, among devotees or among outsiders uh, the the root cause of this is is just one if we really go to the root of the root is that we find it very difficult to accept that we are not the proprietor and controller of everything and that ultimately it is krishna who's the uh, 
uh, doer who's the enjoyer and uh, who's the proprietor. Just this fact that uh, the feeling that I am the doer, uh, it is so prominent and uh, so strongly prevalent in our life that uh, even when we uh, come to uh, Krishna conscious uh, environment and we start the um, <clears throat> process of Krishna consciousness, um, it, it, uh, it takes a lot of uh, sincerity and uh, perseverance to be able to um, move from the, this feeling of uh, uh, mean that we, we may be able to continue a process on a mental level but to be able to actually really understand it, it takes uh, difficulties, challenges and calamities which come in everybody's life. <clears throat> that is one of the facts of life that everybody will be, uh, no matter whether they show it or not, but it's going to come. That's the time when we are really tested whether we can actually, um, we get a chance to understand and to realize uh, the meaning of these philosophies. Um, so, uh, this, uh, this is actually, this problem is uh, because of the environment that we have uh, been created in. And uh, right from the beginning, like if you remember our, from our school days, college days when we were also in studies, it's, uh, you know, if, if everybody would like to excel in something. And uh, if we are good at something, then we don't like somebody else to be or if somebody is very good at the same thing that we are good in, then we find it very difficult to accept it in the right spirit. Maybe if somebody is a very close friend, perhaps. But oftentimes, uh, even in services we find that. If you are very good at, uh, say, maths, and then uh, you don't like science, you don't mind if somebody is excelling in science, it doesn't matter so much. But if you are good in maths and if somebody else is doing very good in maths, you know, you get that competitive juices and you, you feel uh, uh, you have to do better. So that it becomes a kind of a training that starts from that. And then when we are in a, on our own, when we are in occupation, <clears throat> if we are a professional also, we are in an environment where we need to do better because, partly because our promotions depend on that, and partly because we are um, uh, also, if we like what we do, or if you are good at something, some aspect, then we really uh, would like to compete in that or do the best. Uh, and doing the best is, is a good thing if it's the right consciousness. But we do the best because we also we don't like anyone else uh, uh, being better than us in that particular area. And then even if you come to uh, devotional circles, even if you come to Krishna consciousness, the tendency uh, will, uh, if you do not watch out and if you do not counter it, it is very strong, very prevalent. Whatever service we do, even if we are doing deity worship, um, when we are, if we are very good at it, then somebody will say something uh, nice and you like it. And then somebody else does something better. Internally, we, you may, we may feel the pinch uh, that why is he doing better? But if you don't do deity worship, then of course you can glorify everyone who has done so wonderful. We don't have any difficulty. Or if you are, now Janmashtami mood is that everyone is collecting funds. So if we are known to be, you know, a big collector, then we really like to, uh, to, to we like it when we please devotees. We think we are pleasing devotees, we are pleasing Guru and Krishna and doing our best. But the test is when we hear that somebody has done better. Um, I collected 50,000, uh, sold 50,000 coupons worth and somebody is this time um, record one lakh or something. And then what is our internal feeling? So actually this is a measure of what we do. So any service we do, we have to really introspect. We have to see what is our mood because that is really the obstruction that comes to our tendency to not only to develop friendly relationship, but what to speak of actually worshipping Krishna, because Krishna is pleased when he sees others. If we are happy at uh, that Krishna is happy with some other devotee, when Krishna is happy with some other devotee and he gets, uh, that, that devotee gets a mercy, and if we are actually happy, then Krishna is very happy with us. So he knows that whether we, uh, how we feel about it. 
And this can't be selective. We may actually think that I was very happy with this person, but I'm not too happy with this person. And you may justify it by saying because he's not actually a devotee, you know, he's actually done this or he's done that. And um, he may have done this, yes, that is grudgingly we may do, but you know, he has so many other weaknesses or she has so many weaknesses. So this is actually really that voice of uh, envy or the greed, which is what we have been trained in and which is what really is a major obstruction in everything we do. So, uh, what did Prabhupada want? Prabhupada really wanted that everybody works together and uh, from the very beginning he said that uh, I have built a, a house in which the whole world can live. So, he meant it as a community, you know, as a family and a family which is really having Krishna at the center. But that means, pleasing Krishna means want, uh, to to accept that Krishna is the father of all, which means irrespective of backgrounds and uh, natures and uh, you know, whatever, education, gender, etc., that at the root cause, we are all on the same, uh, whether to please Krishna. Uh, and uh, if we really act on that basis, if we try to find happiness on that level, then uh, we can please uh, others and by pleasing others we please Guru, by pleasing Guru we please Krishna. Even if we are, say, um, cooking, for instance, uh, if we are a very good cook, and uh, whether it's in the temple or at home, and then we, we are known for that, people will be uh, speaking highly about it, and we like it and it enthuses us, we get encouraged to, to do more, but then we find someone who's done better, then it's difficult to, um, to accept it. I'm not a cook. But I do hear that sometimes people be, are reluctant. I don't think in so much in devotees, but outside, you know, there are some. Uh, when my mother used to uh, be in touch with one of the famous cooks, and uh, you know, she wrote cookbooks and so on. And then my wife also used to interact with her. And then I've seen others. They're very reluctant to even pass on. If you ask them, then they will be very vague about the recipes, and you know, they will just give some information. You can make out that that they don't want you to really be so good in that. So that tendency shouldn't be there in uh, that, uh, that. So are we actually eager to uh, see everyone, uh, to do, if someone is doing well, how do we see that, uh, uh, what is our consciousness? How, how do we see that person doing in whatever area we, we are doing? Especially when, if we are also comfortable or good in doing that. So, um, Prabhupada says that actually, um, he, he very nicely describes that actually um, the heart will find no pleasure if we, uh, you know, if we are only on the level of the ego. So if the ego will find some satisfaction if we are looking after say material prestige, material position and we excel and we do that, even if we do service. Uh, but so we will find some satisfaction on the level of the ego but that is mixed with uh, eventually with some envy or some frustration, you know, some uh, fear fear of losing everything. That is a, always a factor. And people say that uh, I see someone very happy and I see he's excelling in that. But we only see the external. But someone who's very good, even if he has done something and he's created something, he's a new invention or he's, um, he's, you know, he's uh, started a new company and he's now in five years he's become you know, billions of dollars worth, etc. But at the end of the day what is driving it is like somebody else will compete or somebody else will know and then there are, you know, you have to keep it so confidential, so secret. So that is a fear of losing. Same way if you have been given some wealth or some, if you have something very, uh, if you are attached to something, if you have a beautiful home or a car or a house or a wife or husband or, you know, any of our possessions. If you are, the minute we are attached, then we have a strong, uh, um, uh, you know, inclination to protect it and not to lose it. So then our suspicions arise and then that suspicion becomes the obstacle for having trusting relationships. You don't trust people. Uh, I can say from my experience that uh, one of the, uh, the thing when we interact, when I started interacting with devotees and now also, one of the greatest uh, reliefs by and large is that, you know, we, when we are in, in an uh, in a environment where we know that people's expectations are only on your own level and people's relationships are, uh, if they take you as you are, rather than uh, ultimately uh, for some self-serving uh, <clears throat> need, 
it's a great relief. Otherwise, the instinctive, uh, uh, the instinctive uh, reaction uh, in the outside world would be that when somebody is uh, developing any relationship, eventually we, we see it as a commercial relationship and it's always is. It's always, finally. Even if there is a friendly relationship, they're very close, say that two executives or two managers were working very well together. But they're working well because they have a common purpose which is a commercial purpose. If one of them uh, doesn't do well, eventually he is out. So there is no question of relationship. So the, uh, if finally, at the end of the day, there is, uh, we have to see what is the center. Is, the, is commerce the center? Is it uh, our own livelihood the center? Or is it uh, Krishna the center? And with that center, then all other things which are necessary to maintain or to progress and whatever we have been given, the various attributes and assets can be nurtured. But the test comes when there is a challenge to, um, uh, when a challenge comes up. So Prabhupada says that um, if the, the joy of the soul, I means the soul is happy, the heart is happy when we see two things. When we, when we do our service so well that we inspire others, and when we find happiness when others are succeeding. So, we, we, uh, it's not that when we want to see others are succeeding, we don't do anything. We don't do that service, we don't do any service and we're happy with everyone. That they're doing very nice. Temple is nicely maintained, <laughs> everyone. That's one way. That is not, uh, we are not armchair or, uh, you know, uh, we, we, we have to do, so what we do, we do as best as we can. And in that we, um, we do, uh, and if, if it inspires others to do well, just like Prabhupada when he uh, launched the book distribution and when, he, when it became more organized and then the marathons came, people used to wonder that, I mean, uh, why is Prabhupada setting up, uh, is, it, is it a matter of competitiveness? Superficially one may see that, yes, there is. But what is the meaning of transcendental competition? The transcendental is the key word. Competition is not. Competition is when everyone is doing the same thing, just like we are also doing it. But what Prabhupada really wanted is that it's a movement of inspiration. So if we see that, uh, that ultimately we are there to please Guru and Krishna, then certainly we should do our best. But not to see that you puncture the, someone's tire, you know, of the car so that, that that doesn't go or you take away some books or you, uh, uh, you go to any means to see that you are ahead and the other one is low. No. So uh, ultimately we concentrate and then when we see that someone else is doing well, we... Uh, we are also happy in that. As we've heard so often, uh, His Holiness Radhanath Maharaj, he set the mood when many years ago after a marathon when then there was a felicitation and uh, talk in this room, hall only and Maharaj was told that next year we're going to target one lakh books and his reaction was that I pray that we reach one lakh books and I pray that we are last. So that means to reach one lakh would have been a big jump. Maybe it's a huge jump from what we were which meant that we would have to really, really work hard. But at the same time, he prayed that we are last means he prays that others are inspired to do even more than that. So this is the way we can reconcile our mood of doing very well in what we do, which is absolutely necessary. It's not the quantum or the final goal. It's not that someone, uh, you know, collects five lakhs, he's better than someone who collects 5,000, or someone sells uh, 10,000 books and someone 1,000 is better. No, it's a matter of how much effort we put to the best of our capacity and our means. But at the same time, more important than that is the consciousness in which we do because that consciousness really is what pleases uh, Guru and Krishna. Because there is no point in you know, doing a wonderful seva at the end of it, um, which is very result oriented. At the end of it, the spirit is lost. And that spirit is you know, where we can be uh, you know, loving, uh, having loving relationships, trusting and serving together. So this is, uh, this is at all times uh, a constant lesson for us, uh, how we need to progress. If you see in uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's Leela, actually uh, the whole uh, Chaitanya Charitamrit is entirely full of, we constantly hear about how when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu glorified devotees and the, um, the reactions of all the other, uh, all the other devotees, uh, you know, they, it, it's... Uh, you know, it's quite surprising actually to hear initially the how I mean, they would faint in ecstasy. You know, they would be so happy, so um, joyful. The reactions of the devotees when uh, when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu uh, in his pastime in 
uh, on the night of the Maprakash, then he did not, he rejected uh, uh, Mukunda that initially and he said, I will not see you. I mean, it, it uh, more than Mukunda that the, all the devotees, others were uh, so uh, devastated. So they actually felt uh, for them. So this is the kind of mood because when they see someone else pleasing the Lord, then they get uh, also very pleased. So, uh, Radhanath Maharaj had actually, uh, when he spoke on this subject many years ago, many times, but once he had mentioned that when we are doing services, we should always question, for instance, if we are doing um, garland seva, he would yet mention that we have to check and see whether are we, um, are we making the, are we beautifying um, the, uh, the Lord or are we beautifying our false ego? So, same way, if, even as devotees, if we are uh, cooking, for instance, are we feeding the Lord or feeding our false ego? So, the question is always comparing whether it is, what ultimately is the motive, what pleases us? Are we unhappy because we, somebody else has done better or because, uh, uh, you know, we were not recognized the way we should? So, this is where the subtle uh, uh, challenges come within us. And uh, Srila Prabhupada's prayer was always that uh, I wish you are all better preachers than, uh, than me. Now Prabhupada said the whole movement and we see uh, it's a worldwide movement. But why would Prabhupada say that? The Prabhupada and the Acharyas, <clears throat> they were not there to glorify uh, themselves or to see that we made thousands of disciples. Their whole mood was to please Krishna. So therefore, uh, if others become better preachers, and more and more preachers are coming on, then more and more uh, people become to Krishna consciousness. And that would please, please Krishna. And that is the goal. Because ultimately the goal is to please Krishna. So if we are doing everything for pleasing Krishna, then, then that uh, has to not be lost sight of. So everything that we do has to have that concern. So this is very nicely illustrated in the story of... Uh, uh, means where the two extremes are uh, in, in terms of behavior in the story of uh, Maharaj Prithu and uh, Indra. So Maharaj Prithu was a great king uh, and uh, there were several uh, you know, those pure devotees who were uh, great kings who really when they ruled even the material uh, successes were there as well as uh, spiritual uh, harmony was there. It was a perfect kingdom practically and um, all the demigods were very happy and all the, the flowers would bloom, the rains would come. Uh, there was prosperity everywhere. And um, because of the sacrifices of the great kings, that their only motive was to see that the subjects were happy. And they always um, learnt, uh, they always taught how to surrender to the, uh, to the wise uh, sages who were there and also train their subjects in accordingly. So he had done 99 uh, Ashwamedh Yagyas and he was doing the 100th. And that would have been the culmination of a, it would have been a unsurpassed uh, event. Of course, he was doing it to please the Lord. The yagyas were entirely to please Krishna. It was not to, for their glorification. And, uh, but the only person, Indra was the only one who had actually done 100 yagyas. So he uh, felt extremely uh, vulnerable, right? threatened at that time. And... Uh, uh, now one would say, how, how does he, why would he feel threatened? But that is again the nature of our own, um, uh, our, that's material nature, that when we see that someone is doing, um, we have something which is very, very unique, very special, which nobody in the entire uh, world has it, and we are the ones who, uh, uh, we, are, uh, we, are, we are the only one who has done it, or uh, then we would like to keep the record. So in that mood he, uh, he, what he did is he came um, and he stole the sacrificial horse and uh, suddenly there was chaos and Maharaj Prithu then uh, his son really went after uh, to try to search for the Lord at uh, Indra and uh, now see here also in uh, how Vedic times the, in spite of knowing the, when he found Indra Indra had actually disguised himself and he became a sadhu. So, knowing that he is actually the one who stole the, uh, and all the sages were also telling him that you, know, you don't have to, you have to take the horse and come back. 
the son actually bowed down knowing that he is the thief. Uh, but that was the custom in the Vedic times, how they would, uh, uh, that the, the, the kings were always sub, uh, subservient to the sadhus and uh, that, that was the culture. So then he took the, the uh, but then Indra then uh, he vanished and uh, so he took the horse, uh, the son took the horse and brought back and uh, again they started the preparations and right at the end of uh, massive uh, effort over a long period and finally when it was again to just about to be succeed, uh, completed, the same thing uh, was done by Indra. Again he came, again he stole the horse and this time he changed his disguise into another sadhu. So again the sun went out and the sun went looking and then he disappeared and he brought the horse back. So he repeatedly did this just to break the, uh, to see that uh, it would not happen, the yagya would not be completed. And when this uh, was going on for so many times, then Maharaj Prithu felt responsible that finally I am the one who has to um, stop this. So he prepared to go to search for uh, Indra and because he was powerful enough and he would have been certainly been able to at least arrest Indra or maybe even kill him. He had that kind of power. So the Brahmins and all said that actually, you know, you shouldn't be doing this because uh, you are here to finish the yagya, not finish Indra, you know, so you stay back. And then the, the Brahmins themselves then, they, they had the powers, so they actually started reciting uh, special mantras. And these mantras were so powerful that they could have brought Indra from wherever he was hiding. It would have dragged him there, there was no way he could have remained escaped. So now he was actually being cornered. And just when it was, it looked as if it, now there is no hope for Indra. And then Lord Brahma came. And then Lord Brahma came and asked uh, uh, Prithu Maharaj. So that, uh, you know, uh, he explained, I see Indra is uh, also a very, uh, very nice devotee. It's just that, you know, he's covered by this, uh, his desires and, you know, there would be so much disharmony if, uh, if he's arrested or if he's harmed because, you know, he's such a, he's the leader of the demigods. So he explained to him and he said that, you know, ultimately I am very happy and I know that Lord Vishnu is very happy with your efforts, you know, you've done 99 yagyas. It doesn't make a difference if you do 99 or 100. Uh, the purpose was to please Lord Vishnu and he is happy. So whether you do 99 or not, or do the next one or not, he is happy. So just drop it. If you drop it, then, then there's no need to, uh, you know, do all this and Indra is also happy. And immediately Maharaj Prithu agreed. So imagine, it is very deeply described, great described, how much effort it goes into what it means to actually have an Ashwamed Yagya, one Yagya, which uh, nobody in this world can even do, even dream of doing one. And even in those days to do one was a massive challenge. To do 99 uh, was unthinkable. And to complete the 100th needed someone of the highest because it also needed the complete unanimity of all the kingdoms and the level of purity, even if there's the slightest impure element, it could not be completed. There's so many things to be cross-checked. So in, after doing all this effort, at just the request of Lord Brahma, he immediately dropped. So when Maharaj Prithu was really under that enormous challenge of, you know, uh, having come to that level of final moment of success, and it was in his hands, he, even the obstacle he would have overcome. There was no way he could have, uh, Indra could have escaped him. Uh, and he was asked to, so he took the principle of cooperation. But Prabhupada is telling us, Maharaj Prithu also demonstrated that for harmony and if for the final goal we should not miss. So sometimes uh, when we, so what is the meaning of cooperation? It's a cooperation doesn't mean that I will do what I want and you will find happiness in that. Uh, no, it is actually that uh, we, uh, we have to find a common way and it may be that sometimes both uh, you feel you're right, the other person is also feeling he's right and there is a strong difference of view. So sometimes someone has to let go and by letting go, often the other person then is also, um, uh, by often, always, the other person also takes a softer stand because he sees that there is no opposition. 
So, just uh, it's not a question of proving the point that we are right. It's a question of seeing the uh, what is the mood. So, if you're doing it as part of a movement of Prabhupada, of Iskon, of Vaishnav, then that goal should not be lost. That we are always judged by as a as a small soldier in this army of uh, Vaishnavs or Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's uh, movement, and in that, our role is to see that the minimum we do is not to disrupt harmony and especially if we have been given more leadership role or more authority or a certain higher responsibility then even more so because usually um, that is more visible more disturbing more known to others so to create a harmony is of uh, it is not a pacifist uh, who it is actually uh, of course, if there's a if there's a deviation, if there's a, the opposition on amazing philosophy grounds, that's a different thing. Then there would be a, the highest authority can take a role. But usually that is not the case. It's more on uh, processes and more on manners of doing it. It may be our styles of our uh, approach. It may be our natures. Somebody has a, a certain way to do it. And others have a different way to do it. So it usually comes down to personality, which one way or the other comes down to uh, how our ego reacts. So that is where we have to let go and uh, see how the, uh, how the acceptance is uh, from that. So Maharaj Pitu is actually demonstrating this in the highest level where he uh, just let go for the uh, greater good. So the purpose is to see what is the greater good. And uh, since we are not an individualist uh, movement and certainly not a, our, as, a, as a living entity also, uh, we are not only subservient, we are uh, the servant of the servant, but also we are meant to serve others uh, and at the same time to see that uh, we, uh, we we please uh, Guru and Krishna by uh, helping others. So this is one of the major uh, reasons why there is generally a problem when we cannot cooperate. Some of the other lessons that comes out from uh, uh, from Manas Prithu's uh, behavior and Indra's behavior also is that um, what great men do, other men will follow. So um, it is said that actually when Indra went, uh, changed on disguises and came up with all these bogus sadhu, so it said that each time he did that, that actually started a trend which uh, is actually going on even today. We see so many bogus sadhus and sometimes people are wearing uh, different dresses and uh, behaviors and fooling people. So uh, it's also said that uh, one, another point is that uh, the uh, that uh, we should not go by the dress, we should also go by the quality of the behavior on the heart of the person and this is one of the uh, clear demonstrations where uh, externals always fool. Uh, you know, uh, like Prabhupada also said that uh, it is not merely the dhoti, kurta, shaved head, shikha, you know, and the external dress. It has a necessity, but it, that is not what makes the devotee. It is really um, when it comes to the test of, you know, cooperation and uh, uh, sincerity of purpose, following the regulatory principles, uh, steadily doing our sadhana uh, day in and day out, um, how we rectify our mistakes when they happen. Uh, etc. So this is really what makes the substance of a devotee and then that is makes the substance of a temple. A collection of devotees will make substance of a temple. And that temple really represents uh, uh, the Lord and that's what people come to see. Uh, Radhanath Maharaj uh, has often said that you know when they come to Radha Gopinath temple, devotees, uh, when people come here and people are, people don't come here only because of the carvings or the chandelier or um, the uh, you know the paintings and uh, or even the, the the beautiful dresses and the deities that they will, that will be very much attracted. But if they had to go, come regularly and actually um, become loyal to a movement and when they want to change their hearts, they will come when that environment is created, which is really the substance. And that environment is that are they if you are pleasing Krishna, then Krishna is out of his mercy will will create such a situation where uh, uh, more and more devotees come and in uh, the same way like if you see the sacrifices in Juhu was made we know the stories of how before the deities uh, the deities came first and before the temple was built there was a royal battle actually 
and for a long time they were staying in tents with rats and such mud and slush and such uh, difficult conditions, so much opposition from uh, corrupt MLAs and so on. And in spite of that, they succum uh, they, uh, Prabhupada insisted that they build the temple and uh, Radha Ras Bihari came up. So those sacrifices are really what uh, actually attracts people. There may be people who have not yet come to the stage and they are still envious and they will not come. But there are many people who out of their own um, misery and uh, difficulties will want to look for alternatives and where to turn to. And that's when they come to, uh, they get a chance when they, uh, and it's not a chance actually, Krishna will arrange that situation in such a way that they will, uh, that so-called chance encounter will give them a greater opportunity to dive deeper into um, that association of uh, devotees so that that initial little faith that is there you know becomes a stronger faith and then the anarthas also start moving out so if we see this whole picture at all times then we know that uh, we are only a tiny cog in the wheel also another lesson is that uh, uh, so when the ego is infatuated when the ego is grown uh, big then we become also very insensitive to others like uh, indra's uh, case at that moment he was so much uh, working on a matter of ego that he couldn't see the kind of disruptions that were taking place he just couldn't see on any other sensible time um, you know he would have been uh, if he was explained that <coughs> that uh, what Maharaj Prithu is doing he would have perfectly understood the, the magnitude of the service that Prithu Maharaj is doing and the benefit to whole mankind um, but in that moment of madness when he was uh, enraged by that uh, uh, anger and envy um, it, it, it's a lesson for us that uh, you know even for our small achievements we we can uh, you know our ego can overcome us and then we become so insensitive and we cannot uh, indifferent to uh, to the reactions of others and also the impact to the others And uh, lastly, I'd like to end by uh, this conversation between Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Ramanand Rai, where Chaitanya Mahaprabhu asked Ramanand Rai as to uh, what is the na greatest name, greatest fame uh, in the world. And Ramanand Rai Prabhu said that uh, the greatest fame is uh, to be known as a humble devotee. So as he has explained you know and he was taken it was used as an instrument by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu for giving us the perfect uh, uh, the perfect answers to so many questions so in this particular instance also even from the point of view because it doesn't matter if people don't see whether somebody has done the sacrifice now is it Juhu's sacrifice or many of the other temples uh, devotees may have sacrificed or Practically, we also may not be knowing when so many efforts were made in the all over the world. See, when we read in the Lilamrit also, we only read what actually uh, was only parts of the efforts. But there were 5,000 devotees, there were so many others who were involved. Many, many sacrifices have gone unnoticed to anyone. Completely, anyone means anyone. Nobody must be knowing. But certainly, uh, Guru and Krishna would know. And that is enough. So, that's... Uh, being a humble devotee means we don't look for seeing that whether uh, at the uh, we, we do everything right and then at the end of it we want to see whether it has been noticed or not. It is just that whether it's noticed or not, whether it's a, even if it's a failure. We heard that there were 108 temples when Prabhupada was there before he left this planet. But it didn't mean that they made only 108 efforts. They must have made several hundreds more. Many efforts must have fallen by the wayside. Many, many thousands of initiatives must have been wasted. So is it that that is of no value and only because you succeed is value? Absolutely not. You know, it is just the, uh, the, that the effort to do, to please the Guru is the most important thing. Finally, an initiative may work or not is, uh, is entirely in the hands of the Lord. So this is what uh, is the, is the uh, crucial aspect that we should remember in our uh, efforts to, to serve the uh, devotees and Guru that uh, the consciousness in which, which we do 
uh, is most important to see that we, if we are pleasing Krishna, if that is the goal, and Krishna will not be pleased if we don't uh, have harmonious relationships. Um, and even in the services that we do, we do the best we can, and we should excel in that. We should be, uh, we should use our creativity, ingenuity, or any initiative that we have. Uh, the enthusiasm has to be there to make it successful, but never losing the sight of the fact that we, uh, it shouldn't uh, override uh, or overrule the the harmony that is necessary in seeing that other people's uh, uh, sensitivities are not affected. So, Hare Krishna, if there's any questions, uh, any comments? Granth Raj Srimad Bhagavatam ki jai, Srila Prabhupada ki jai.